Welcome, everyone. We are today trying something a little bit new. We're going to be answering questions from Reddit, from the r slash cooperatives uh, page. Um, and there's uh, a lot of a lot of uh, conversation from people interested in co-ops on there, and a lot of questions come up. So we thought we'd take a shot at uh, at answering a few of them. So. Um, I'm here with uh, with Chris, and we're going to give it a shot. <laughs> All right, so first question from Reddit. Uh, this is from user Terran Games. Uh, they ask, do worker cooperatives expand less than traditional firms? I've seen this claim before again and again that worker co-ops would expand less than conventional firms because they would be, at least in part, when it comes to profits, incentivized to expand only to the point where productivity per worker stops increasing, while a traditional firm would keep expanding until productivity per work starts to decrease because the investors can, quote, skim off the top, so to speak, of each worker. I've only seen this claim just as a theoretical model, though. So is there any evidence that this happens in the real world? Are there any studies that look at this specifically? Um, so first of all, I will just start by saying uh, this is a very common type of critique of worker co-ops. And it's, a, it's not really valid. It's, a, it's kind of a, a bad faith critique, I think. And a lot of economics is like this. It's all very theoretical. As, the, as Terran Games points out, um, you know, uh, in economics, how they think normal firms operate is all theoretical and doesn't match up with the reality that you find on the ground either. So um, what some economic theory, you know, claims is going to happen in is not necessarily, doesn't really mean anything. We should not take that um, too much. Um, to answer the, the his actual questions, though, have, have we seen any actual uh, studies on this? Um, the answer, so far as I know, is there haven't been really many, if any, serious studies of this particular questions. The ones that I'm aware of, and I was looking this morning for the book and, and wasn't able to find it, um, about, uh, there's a, a, a book that came out, uh, I believe in the 90s, about worker co-ops uh, in the Pacific Northwest in the uh, plywood industry. And he, uh, the author of that book, is an economist. Um, and and looked at this particular question and found that the worker co-ops, which there were many in the Pacific Northwest in the plywood industry, uh, expanded at about the same rate or faster uh, than the uh, traditional firms. So uh, that were in the same industry. Um, all of those firms, all of those worker co-ops, I will say, have now gone out of business. However, all of the traditional firms up there have pretty much gone out of business as well. Uh, so what ended up causing the downfall of the uh, worker co-op plywood industry in the Pacific Northwest was not anything to do with the cooperative model. Um, you know, there uh, it was to do with international economics and a whole lot of cheap uh, l uh, lumber products coming in from uh, overseas and from Canada that shut everybody down and, and made their their business um, not viable any longer. So, you know, to the extent that it's been looked at at all that I'm aware of, uh, the answer is there's nothing really to back this up. Uh, some worker co-ops will have difficulties um, expanding for different reasons. Um, you know, one common one is that, uh, you know, especially in smaller worker co-ops, um, Jim talked about this with, uh, has talked about this with a tech worker co-op that he started at um, where, everybody wanted to get all of the surplus paid out to the members kind of like all the time or, you know, all of it and not really keep a rainy day fund um, or a growth fund, you know, not retain enough earnings in the co-op to do that. And so that can be a problem, uh, but that same kind of thing can be a problem with any uh, small business or with any business. Um, uh, and that's, again, it's just on a, you know, on an individual business level, yeah, that kind of thing can happen. But on the whole, is this like a problem for all worker co-ops? No, not at all. Um, Chris, do you have anything you want to add to my? Oh, yeah. I think it seems to me that uh, a lot of the contemporary worker co-ops or people who build them seem to choose 
uh, or go to go a path where they're kind of kind of limit or cap the amount of people they're working with, but it doesn't have to be that way. Would you say that's kind of something that happens? Well, you mean in terms of just the the, the co-op deciding like we only need 15 employees and you know, yeah, like shows up and wants to be a member, like we don't have a job for you. I mean, that's exactly like any other small business. Um, you know, I mean, you, you only have so much demand, you're only moving so much product, you have so much revenue. Um, you know, if you think that you can, you know, if you're already maxed and you need more people to help you, then you'll go looking to hire somebody. Right. I mean, that's all, that's, that's not a problem. Um, but you know, if, if, when we're in an economic situation where there's more workers looking for good jobs at worker co-ops and there are worker co-ops to hire them, yeah, there's going to be a, a disconnect there. Um, but I mean, a business can't expand its employee, its, its employee base, you know, or its membership base when it's a co-op just because there are more people who want to be members, right? The, the business, the, the money part's got to be there too. Um, but again, not a co-op problem. That's just a business reality. I mean, I remember I, I used to work, I waited tables at a Japanese restaurant, um, in Bozeman, Montana, uh, for about a year. And, um, the, it, that was 2011 into 2011 to into 2012. And the number of people like every single day, I swear, we had people come in and want work looking for work. We weren't hiring <laughs> like none of us were even full time. And so, I mean, that wasn't a worker co-op, but you know, it depends on the economic situation. Um, you know, it kind of in the, in the larger, uh, economy as to whether or not it's going to be an issue, I think. Um, shall we go to the next one? Uh, no, well, I, I want to, I wonder if this is relevant to the conversation. It's the idea that some companies also don't want to expand, um, cause they don't want to lose the intimacy that comes from it having a lot of a lot more people but i don't see why a worker call couldn't be able to to maintain intimacy just through like you know careful expansion you know federating yeah. clusters of, of workers who want to or people who want to maintain that intimacy yeah and there are lots of different ways to expand as well so i mean we have the example in the worker co-op movement of on the one hand something like mondragon who they have expanded uh massively uh uh, maybe overexpanded in some areas, but how they've done that, at least in part, is through purchasing factories overseas in, you know, say China or India, um, other countries like that, that they then run as capitalist enterprises. You know, they're just, they're factories that are owned by Mondragon Co-op. Um, but the workers in those factories are not themselves members of the co-op, uh, if, you know, they're outside the, of Spain and there's, that's, there's been a lot of conversation internally within Mondragon, you know, about that. It's definitely not like everybody's all for it. Um, but you know, there's one way to expand. So you can definitely say, well, you know, being a worker co-op has not, you know, didn't stop them from expanding. Um, and, it, and often in exactly the same way as the capitalist enterprises do, but then you can look at somebody, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, like the Arismendi Association of Cooperatives in the Bay Area, right? Where, where you started out with um, the worker cooperative, the cheese board bakery. And then, and that was, you know, it was a conversion initially and was running for quite a while until Tim Hewitt and another of uh, another person whose name I sadly forget, um, approached them and said, hey, you, you've got a great model here. Um, can we like help you franchise it basically? And they said, hell yeah. And so they um, found a, a property that they could set up another bakery at and, you know, found other people who were interested in doing a worker co-op. And I think the cheese board sent over a, a member or two to, to help them get started and help them with financing. And they, you know, kind of franchised and they started the Arizmendi Bakery. And now they had two and then they did it again. <laughs> and they spun off a third bakery and then they spun off a fourth until, I mean, they had like six at one point. I don't know if, if all six of those are still going. Um, uh, but 
yeah, the, I mean, they still have to this day, like a, a network of co-ops. So that's another way that co-ops can expand that it's expanding the number of people who are, you know, worker owners um, without any of the actual businesses themselves expanding, right? So it's expansion through networking of small businesses rather than expanding by trying to just get as big as you can in one entity. Um, and, and it's always also okay to talk about the growth or limits to expansion. Like there's this obsession with everything constantly having yes. to expand. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, we, <laughs> We live in this particular time where, um, and in this particular country where, you know, we have a lot of us um, have have benefited from a very unsustainable economic system. And we should probably be thinking about uh, changing that. And so growth is not necessarily growth for its own sake. It's not a good thing. Um, one last thing just on the like traditional firm side, again, kind of busting some of these myths, um, firms do not hire workers until productivity per worker starts to decrease. Like th they hire workers and fire workers on uh, completely unrelated grounds. You know, how is this going to look to the shareholders at the next, um, you know, earnings call? Um, <laughs> that kind of thing. Is this going to, you know, look good for, you know, when the CEO asks for a bonus? Like that's why they're making employment decisions on that kind of thing. And if you really want to understand how modern, how actual businesses actually operate. I think one of the best books to read is actually kind of an old one uh, by Thorstein Veblen called The Theory of Business Enterprise. And um, he, in a very kind of funny way, just goes through and describes exactly how businesses actually function. And the like, and it has nothing to do with supply and demand. <laughs> you know, it has to do with you're in business to make money and you can make money by, um, you know, either helping industry flourish. Sometimes you make money doing that, in which case a business person will do that. And other times you make money by keeping industry, you know, by, uh, from flourishing by, you know, cutting the knees out from underneath that kind of thing. And, uh, when you make money, if you make money, like they'll do that as well. So, um, if you want to understand how business really operates like a traditional business, I'd say read Veblen and, um, and yeah, and know that worker co-ops, uh, they can expand just as well as, as anybody else. So that maybe we'll go on to the next one. Let's see. Can you read that at all? Is that too small for you? It's pretty small. Yeah, you got to zoom in. Here we go. Look at that. All right. So challenges of building community cooperatives in a tourist town. Uh, this is a long comment. So I'm not really going to, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Suffice it to say, small town, Western Canada, it's a ski town. Um, and this person is a, you know, lives there year round as a, is a resident, um, has started several, you know, cooperatives in the community, has been on the board of, you know, different nonprofit things and says that the core challenge is a lack of understanding of cooperatives amongst the general populace. Okay. However, the biggest challenge seems to be getting people to work collectively. Since the rise of neoliberalism, it seems like there is this expectation of community events, services, and identity, but that someone else will always do the work to make that happen. It feels a bit like trading community and service organizations for fee-for-service events. Um, so I'll stop there to comment on that. Um, I don't know if you've seen this, Chris, or if you've experienced this, or this is, uh, but that this definitely rings very true to me in a lot of ways. And I know, um, like for instance, my my mother is very active um, in a lot of community organizations in her church and bowling league and stuff like this. And she's she has you know commented on the fact that um, it's very very difficult now. It seems like much more so than it was, you know, 20 years ago to get people to take on leadership roles in those, uh, organizations. And so people like her and some, you know, other older ladies in their like seventies and beyond have been just like kind of stuck doing the bookkeeping and the being the board chair and whatnot, just because nobody else wants to take on the leadership positions, even though they still want, you know, the, the organization. So, 
Um, and I don't know if that's to do with neoliberalism or not, but I think uh, Robert Putnam wrote Bowling Alone back in the 90s, so probably right around the same time. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, Chris? Do you experience, does this sound at all familiar to you? And Oh, people just kind of showing people just kind of showing up to stuff and not uh, sharing in the work. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I feel like in my experience, I feel like it has to do with kind of like there not being anything exciting um, around the work and people are, are kind of like they're checking out what exists. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it seems like there's not really stuff that to really grasp people's attention to where they want to commit. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe it's like just, yeah, maybe it's a, maybe different people, I suspect different people have different things that they're looking for that maybe even they don't know what they're looking for. Um, Do you find, um, I mean, so you're living in a much bigger population centers uh, than I am. Like we're on opposite ends of the spectrum and, and what they're, you know, they, I've found here, and, and they say uh, later on, is that there's the same kind of small group of people uh, who kind of end up doing everything. So like, you know, the person who's, you know, the board chair for the local artists uh, committee is also, you know, the secretary of the Grange and is also on the senior citizens, <laughs> you know, active. It's like the same, like 20 people kind of doing everything. Do you find that in Chicago? Like, do you see that same sort of dynamic where there's tends to be a small core of people who kind of are in, have their fingers in kind of everything? Um, yeah, I, I think if, I think if you are in a sense, yeah, that kind of stuff does happen in Chicago, I believe. And um, if it's not, that it's um there are kind of like the the core folks holding down different things um they all talk to each other quite a bit mm -hmm. i think that's the thing as well um yeah 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 so yeah they say you know they've come to realize their community is largely made of people who have moved here to ski. That's definitely a problem. If you live in some of the communities and places like where I'm at in Montana, <laughs> a lot of uh, what we call either tourons, which is a portmanteau of tourist and moron. Um, you can do a Google search for a uh, tourist mauled by bear. If you want to see good examples of tourron uh, behavior <laughs> um, or, you know, the, the, uh, they call them the, the the snowbirds or whatever you know they come for the come for the skiing um or they come for the fishing in the summer or something like that and then head off and it does make it hard for those of us who live here full time because like there are a lot of people who will sh show up um but don't really contribute because they don't actually live there um yeah so they say, particularly since our population doesn't see this as their home forever, just their home for now. And this puts a lot of strain on the 30 plus or minus people that essentially keep all of the boards and nonprofits and co-ops functioning. Frankly, it makes me worry about the vitality of our community as a whole. Um, and so they talk about forming a co-op community radio station. Um, and they had some strong initial boards, but uh, it's gotten to a point where this one person, this poster, uh, what is their name? crafty swing uh is kind of running the running the show running the whole radio station they say they have an agm coming up and a few new board members joining as others leave but it feels like we're on a razor's edge um again i i think this is all like very common kind of dynamics and i don't i think part of it has to do with our uh culture i think they're right about that but um also, it might just be partially how things actually get done in the real world. Um, and that being a co-op person means doing the things that other people aren't willing to do. And then also making sure that you're not like becoming a dictator in doing that, like continually drawing people in. Um, so, and uh, yeah, and so they, they end with a series of questions. Um, they say, uh, you know, they feel like they're on a razor's edge, but that's basically how it felt on the eight-ish boards that I've served on over the past seven years. Is volunteerism just dead? Are there too many easier distractions in life? 
Is there not enough understanding that people can tangibly make their communities better? Or are people just struggling so much to get by that the capacity to take on ongoing volunteer commitments that require tough decision making is understandably just not possible? There's a string of questions. Chris, you got to, what do you think? Any of that? Yeah, I, I kind of feel like it would be cool to be an ongoing collaboration with someone like that who's who's going through that because it sounds like a very difficult situation. Um, I wonder if they're, I wonder what their outreach looks like for getting more folks, you know, because I, well, I wonder if they're like stuck in a cycle where, um, go ahead. Oh, oh, well, I was just going to say they do mention that they uh, follow all the best practices for ensuring board members have good training, the recruitment and evergreen lists are perpetually being updated, the memberships continually engaged. So anyway, just, but and the membership is continually engaged. But if it's not working, maybe like whatever you're doing is not having the desired effects, right? It's still whether they're best practices or not, mm -hmm. might want to try something different. Man, I haven't, I don't think I've been in that situation. I haven't seen that. I feel like wherever people, well, that's good. in my yeah. experience, I feel like wherever people weren't engaging, it's because like the, the outreach was pretty poor or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like the organizers See, doing it were kind of incompetent. Right. Oh yeah. And that is definitely a thing. And the thing with incompetency is you don't realize that you're incompetent. Right. Like, and this is true for all of us, like by definition, you don't know that you're incompetent, <laughs> you know, generally, um, it, you know, uh, so, you know, if, if you think that, you know, you're doing all the right things, but you're not, again, not having the right effect and uh, not having the right outcome, then maybe you got to try something else. Okay. Um, Anything else you want to say about this, Chris? Sounds like it's not really yeah, did, did they, um, experience you bad. Well, I know it is a thing because I, I, uh elsewhere i remember it was i think one of the tenant unions in canada they mm -hmm. had they had a few like hundreds of members but the core of people participating and putting it together was just like three to seven people and it's been like that for years mm -hmm. um, so it's not <laughs> this stuff does happen and I, don't, I don't know oh yeah it happens um and go ahead no, I was going to say, I mean, I just thought of another example. Now that you say that, they, uh, I know it. One intentional community, longstanding intentional community that I know of, I won't name names, but they've uh, always had a real hard time getting more people into like the core organizing group. Um, and it's been this like group of, you know, 10 to 12 people like since the beginning. And they've had a little bit of turnover, but, you know, they've got like 80 people living there and only 10 people want to be like full <laughs> you know, fully uh, responsible. I, most people, you know, just want to have cheap rent and good food and all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, it can be an issue in the cities as well. But I, like I said, maybe that's just how things work, at least in the U.S. Maybe as part of our so, uh, social system. But I know the tech. Yeah, I mean, there's probably deeper things that work too, though. Um, like you said, Josh, I, I, well, as we've talked about before, like a lot of the co-op world is kind of like it. It's like athe atheist, anti, more like atheist or like in the sense of like no one ever talks about spirituality. And and like, I don't know if I said this here, but I, I know I've told some local folks that if we're not talking about spirituality, like the whole thing about community to me is a lie. Um, mm -hmm. because to me, community, part of community means you're able to bring your entire self. And a lot of people I know who, uh, are like, getting involved with co-op stuff, like they're hardcore religious. Like, even if I'm not into their religion, like mm -hmm. I know that like what's on their mind all the time or whatever it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, their religion. And so that's why I wonder if like some of this stuff is going on and, some of this stuff. Maybe there's like only so many years where you can get by um, on the excitement of an idea. Uh, mm -hmm. And after a while, you know, people denying being unable to bring their complete self 
um, maybe there's you know a half life to that that's pretty apparent. Maybe that's why. It, it, it's, if I recall correctly, Josh, is this a situation where there's some type of like degeneration going on or stagnancy going on? No, no I mean, not no. They, they're just no, not I mean, able to grow it. Yeah, they, I mean, they're just it, it, having a hard time bringing more people into the core group. And as the you know people who founded it are. Uh, frankly getting old and dying it's mm -hmm. starting to become like an issue you know um so it, i mean part of it, it you know it's interesting you're talking about that and i think yeah like what are we trying to do as you know in community organizing you're trying to create community spirit how can you have community spirit without some kind of spirituality right um and uh yeah so it, and and the people who you know started this intentional community definitely like there was a spirituality type of like part to it right they were um it wasn't in religious terms or anything like that but um definitely some touchy-feely woo-woo hippie stuff uh you know that <laughs> type of spirituality and the people you know that core group were very invested in that um and i think what's happened is more people are interested in what that has created and benefiting from what that's created then uh are interested in actually like buying in whole hog to the you know 100 solidarity we're all in this together mentality that's made possible the you know all the stuff that they're benefiting from so um yeah again and i don't know if if that's a a cultural thing i don't understand it personally because if i was there if i like was from that part of the country i would totally in a heartbeat be in that like yeah yeah like sign me up yesterday um so i don't understand the the people there who don't um want to do that but i i've known i'm a weirdo for a while so uh hopefully we, we can return to this in the future and it's like part of the dialogue yeah yeah uh, we'll have to keep working on it so let's see um this one will be a short one i think any co-op developers doing work for indigenous communities i'm currently engaged in volunteer work focusing on assisting an indigenous community in the high andes to establish a cooperative after two years of dedicated effort we're poised to launch the project in about six months i'm eager to connect with like-minded individuals involved in similar initiatives seeking to exchange ideas and offer mutual support um my first question, I guess, for, is is actually for this person would be, what are you doing? Like, like, how are you assisting a community in the Andes forming a cooperative, right? Like, um, like I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious as to what that looks like as somebody who, you know, at some point, you know, was quote unquote, assisting a, a community in Nepal, like building a school um, and actually, you know, helped him try to set up a, tried to help him set up a co-op, but you know, what that experience taught me very clearly is, is I mean, it was already clear before that was uh, as a volunteer from outside the country, there ain't much you can do. Like legitimately, like if like the, the people in the co-op make the co-op just like anywhere else. It's like, if you were assisting, if you're a volunteer assisting people set up a co-op in the U S as I've also done, it's the same deal. <laughs> like there's, you know, you could, your assistance is, is very limited. Um, and, and of course, you know, there's always the, the question of, um, you know, is this a, you know, what kind of effort is this? Is this a grassroots effort? Is this some kind of top down thing? Um, so anyway, I don't know if you have any thoughts on co-op developers working with indigenous communities in the high Andes. Or any well, place else. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how far I would even be able to participate in this conversation, but one thing that comes to mind for me is, well, who is the person? How what's their relationship to to the locals? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a trend that's gonna that's starting to develop also, and I'm not saying this person is white, but um, where some folks of color are gonna begin to regard um, white folks getting involved with uh co-ops of color as infiltrators like mm -hmm. i've already i'm already starting to see those complaints because 
there are certain forms of dependency and and then the white and then the like the white domination bleeds into the it corrupts the effort but um that's more for just like in general for co-op awareness um mm -hmm. some of those mm -hmm. dynamics i mean and also I, I mean i just think i don't know i first i read this and i just kind of assume that this person is an american um they write as though they're an american uh, like you know just the style of english i guess how they spell cooperative um and i just wonder what in the hell does can any american teach anybody like united states of america american teach any south american about cooperation <laughs> or like community building or anything like dude we need to be going down there to learn from from them like i'm pretty sure not the other way around since like from what i can tell basically anybody outside the u.s is probably just better at cooperating <laughs> naturally than we are we're, we're pretty trash um like on the global uh scale so um anyway uh yeah it, 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 mostly with this question i just find there's some possibly problematic aspects to it as you're pointing well, out i mean it'd be um, cool to find out that they are like uh indigenous person who you know they're they've gone from like one part of that uh area to another part and they happen to be interested in the co-op model um hopefully not disregarding the what might be way better ways of relating that exist that maybe some folks don't want to share to the outside world um so mm -hmm. quickly yep yeah there's that as well i mean it's always touchy like we have a history of colonialism right like so when you're just like another white person but you're like well i know like for hundreds of years we've been saying we're only here to help <laughs> but this time for real for real i'm only here to help like i know the last time they were here they said we're only here to help and then they like stole all your shit and like <laughs> raped the land and all that but I, no no this time you can trust me like come on man like history exists like let's like have some awareness of who we are as Americans, or at least for me, like as a white American, especially like, yeah, of course, like, why would, why would anybody trust us? Like, oh, you're just here to, cause you have positive values you want to share with us. Well, that's literally what we've been saying forever. So like, <laughs> we need something better. Um, <laughs> okay. So this, Thoughts on this method of worker cooperative categoriz categorization by the YouTuber Rose Wrist. I think it can be help. It can be a helpful way to describe different methods of financing cooperative enterprises, especially since some laymen seem not to know that there are different types at all. Um, so they're just asking for thoughts on this, um, I guess, chart which just lays out like they have these kind of unique ways of describing co-ops up here, uh, completely autonomous cooperatives, autonomous cooperatives, majority cooperatives don't know what any of that means. Um, the commenter said that there was just this rose wrist person's like personal categorization method and they have ESOPs and conventional firms. Uh, they do have, you know, number of different types of, financing, which are in fact, um, types of financing. So member capital contributions, that's going to be the major one for a lot of co-ops, um, donations, much less common, but yeah, still crowdfunding. Yes. That is a, a thing you can do now. Um, loans, especially friends and family loans, uh, very important for setting up co-ops often, um, along with loans from, uh, CDFIs and whatnot like um, shared capital or any of the seed commons funds. Pre-selling, I'm guessing this would be like selling gift cards in advance for your services or something like that. Um, consumer memberships, this is the same thing. Oh, well, I guess maybe not. Consumer memberships, I guess, would be buying your membership share and maybe member capital contributions would be in addition to that. Usually they're kind of thought of as 
one and the same, I guess. I, I, um, but uh, anyway, bartering, okay, grant subsidies, asset sales. Yes, yeah, you can sell stuff to fund your business. Yes, that's true. Divestments, um, I guess, selling other investments to put it into your stocks. Like I, so I don't know how helpful this this actual chart is. Um, like it does list a whole lot of different ways you can do financing. Um, and then I think that's according cool. to, just reading that financing types column, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, it does help you at least think about different ways that you could be raising money. Um, not sure what sponsorships are and I'm not really sure what the yellow indicates. I would assume that red means you don't do it. Green means you do. And yellow is like maybe sometimes, um, would seem to make the, sense. The sponsorship refer to how like we should be getting sponsored for this youth for like <laughs> <laughs> I, I i don't know if this is if this is uh you know the sponsor this video is sponsored by yeah Ridge wallace yeah. or whatever um yeah well, i don't know if that's what they're referring to apparently completely autonomous cooperatives only sometimes would do that i don't know um non-voting shares this this would be what's called a preferred share, selling a preferred share. According to Rose Wrist, apparently a completely autonomous co-op would not sell preferred shares. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, but yes, selling preferred shares. I think that's actually a, a good thing to do that most co-ops, like more co-ops should be doing. I think it would be a, a good way to interconnect cooperatives is for co-ops to own preferred shares from other co-ops. Um, worker co-ops specifically <clears throat> non-voting shares with a board seat or board and observer rights. Yeah. If you're selling a uh, boy, a, a share with, I guess a, no voting, but you can just watch the board meetings. Um, I guess that would be a thing. Uh, non-controlling voting shares. I can't, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm guessing maybe they're thinking of like the Wyoming uh, co-op law that allows like, 49% investor ownership of voting shares um, and then controlling voting shares. I guess if you can have more than 51%, I'm guessing, I'm not really sure. Um, anything with voting shares, I think it in my book, if you're selling voting shares to people who are not part of the co-op, it's, it's real questionable as to whether or not you're actually co-op anymore, even if Wyoming thinks you are. So, um, but I don't know. Any thoughts on this, Chris? I like the, the, the work that they put into it. Um, it's good. You'd be the it, positive one. It's, it, it's good for discussion, even if it's it is. Like, it is. Somebody. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. I'm highly critical, but go ahead. No, nah, I mean, hopefully, we, we, I mean, this is, yeah, getting people thinking about this stuff. Because um, I was, I mean, I was thinking about what you're saying about the whole, like, complete autonomous co-op so do, would you say that a complete not not according to this to this graph mm -hmm. but would, would you say that a complete autonomous cooperative um by whatever definition of that of your of, of that term mm -hmm. that you want to make up on the fly um could exist while having shares that that while having preferred shares purchased from other uh co-ops yeah yeah, if they're if they're preferred non-voting shares, then for sure. Um, I mean, and I I think and like why it's weird I think to use the term autonomy at, in this way is because one of the cooperative principles is autonomy, like co-ops are redundant. autonomous. So yeah, it's like if you're not autonomous, you're not a co-op, like by definition, I think. Um, and that's why I think if you're selling voting shares to investors, you're question it's questionable as to whether you can even call yourself a co-op because you're losing some degree of that autonomy so for me i would say there's no need for complete autonomous versus autonomous or to even have that uh, attach that word to co-ops because they're they should be autonomous by definition um, although <laughs> well yeah it, i mean it's it's debatable right with some co-ops but um i mean i guess with autonomy it, it just means so are people who are not members do they have control over the co-op and you know maybe with some larger co-ops you could make that argument um i don't know consumer co-ops and stuff like that for sure rei for instance um as a cooperative um, you could say 
Is that an autonomous cooperative? Well, there's nobody outside of the co-op that's making um, decisions for it. Uh, it's the management of the co-op, which is just part of the co-op, who's making all the bad decisions. Um, I don't know. I don't know. To me, you know, what this, and I, I will say this, and it's going to sound critical because it is, um, but I have noticed that there are a lot of people, especially younger people, like in their 20s, who are very interested in co-ops and like the theory and the concept, and they're totally done with the, you know, the capitalist uh, nonsense. And that's great. Um, but when they start getting interested in co-ops rather than like going and seeing what's been done and what's going on out there and like educating themselves in like the state of the cooperative movement, they just sit around and think about why it's and come up with their own like schemas for things and how to think about things. And then some of them will make YouTube videos or produce other content. And I've definitely seen a number of videos that was like, okay, you're somebody who just found out about co-ops like two months ago you've been reading some stuff and thinking about it and you made a video and a bunch of it's just very ill-informed um but it got like ten thousand views and so now a whole bunch of people think like whatever you wrong thing you thought about worker co-ops right and i mean and i again i'm even guilty of this myself when i started working for geo i didn't have very much experience with co-ops and there are a couple of interviews where i just asked some really dumb questions that I would never ask today because I know a few things after 10 years, but you know. Um, hey, have you seen have you seen the end of Billy Madison during that that contest? <laughs> the academic uh, we're all dumber for listening <laughs> to your answer. May yeah, God have, have mercy upon your soul. <laughs> this is also a uh, this is also a problem. And I don't know. I don't know Rose Wrist, and I haven't watched their content so i cannot comment on them specifically i will look at this and say okay it looks like you're kind of off in your own head doing your own little thing um and maybe try like using the terminology that everybody else is using so that like what you're doing fits in with that um and we can actually make it a conversation uh but there are a lot of people on reddit like so there'll be these questions and it'll be somebody's asking a question about how to fire somebody or how to um you know set wages and somebody will literally start their answer out I have no experience and I don't know, but, and then continue and then proceed to answer the question as though it's like you said, like, if you don't know anything about it, you don't have to answer the question. Like you just stop there. As soon as you type, well, I don't have any experience here. Like, okay, you can stop. Because somebody be with bot? experience will uh, answer. <laughs> can, that, can those be bots or are bots? Not oh, no, that? no. These are real people. These are just real and I'm sorry, it's just being a lot of it, I think, is just being a young person and, you know, kind of not being aware of all the stuff that you don't know. We were all there um, and are yeah, there just, to some extent still. Hopefully so. I think by the end of this guy, will have mercy on my soul. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Mine too. So I, go, let's go back and find every cringy <laughs> wrong thing Josh has ever said. Like, ooh. Um, OK, as someone supportive of co-ops, I have a question about them. Um, I've been supportive of co-ops and support a cooperative based economy and see it as a much more ethical system that empowers many. However, there's one question I have about them. How do co-ops lay off someone when it is needed? For example, let's say that an employee frequently calls in. I don't mean genuine sickness or mental health problems or the occasional vacation. I mean constantly calling in to the point it becomes a burden or fake sicking. Is it rude, mean, or 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 they are rude or mean or have done some misconduct such as stealing i don't want this to happen but sometimes it has to be done and in such as it, such as in the cases i mentioned also how do co-ops hire someone thanks so <laughs> the question is um how do co-ops fire and hire someone um the response that got echoed in the comments to this is look in the bylaws right like it depends on the co-op it's in the bylaws um but i think we can maybe say a little bit more about like in general how these kind of things get handled i don't know if you want to say anything chris if you have any experience here i do um hey i heard some nasty stuff um for the firing i don't want to say the co-op but yeah no nah, it was someone it's a, it's a popular co-op, but 
Was it a worker co-op? Yeah, worker co-op. Mm. And they're like, hey, sometimes people are going to come in and they're not, you know, they're just going to take. They're not going to put back and, you know, they're going to drag your name in the mud. And um, But that's, you know, one side of that story. Um, mm-hmm. I was I was surprised to learn that uh, Isthmus Manufacturing because they 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 did that um there's like that field trip that happened this year I think it was this mm-hmm. year where a lot of the Madison folks went to I'm sorry a lot of the Milwaukee folks went to Madison I believe and maybe there's mm-hmm. some other folks involved like a field trip and uh, I think the first stop was at Isthmus and there uh, my friends who went in because I had to be on a conversation i had to be on a call during the tour they said that um that they were told by isthmus that they hired like one person every three months i believe um because they had a problem in the past where bringing too many people in at the same time uh disrupted the cohesion of the current workforce and so that was pretty cool to hear i've um mm-hmm Sorry, I'll let you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, on, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that kind of goes back to our the the first question about right growth and and maybe you know and questions of co op growth. Like, here we go, an example of one where it's like, yeah, we limit our growth. We do for very good reasons. Um, so, uh, you know, laying somebody off in a co op again, you know, like the answer is yeah. You it's the the process would be laid out in the bylaws. Usually, it will be something like you know you try to work it out with the with the with the people there'll be some kind of formal complaint process if you can't work it out amongst yourselves which i guess be the whole reason for the complaint process and um you know there's uh you know if you can't you will either have a committee of people generally have a committee of people or if it's a smaller co-op maybe you know all the rest of the members um it will kind of you know listen to both sides and and make a determination and if things have gotten to a point where um you know a, a number a lot of the members feel like this person needs to be voted off the island as it were then and that happens and it, but it is going to be a vote of your other members is going to be what what puts you um out of a job or you know and then you'll of course have to get paid back your membership share and stuff like that um but yeah i was I was around when a co-op had to do that uh, to somebody and I saw all the reasons for it. And it was very, um, very legitimate what the, you know, the actions that were taken. Um, uh, however, despite that, it still led to a huge lawsuit, <laughs> uh, which I mean, wasn't, it was huge because the person like sued for $2 million, which was ridiculous with a co-op that had like 1500 bucks in their bank account. Um, but nonetheless, they still ended up having to spend a bunch of money on lawyers and a bunch of time in front of the judge and stuff like that. So no fun for anybody. Um, you really do want to avoid having to fire anybody. And the, that's the reason why, as part of the hiring process, ev- pretty much every co-op, I don't know one that doesn't, has some sort of probationary period, whether it be six months or a year or a thousand hours or whatever it is that you are not before you that you work there before you become a member so people have a chance to see how you work what you're like um and stuff like that so you try to dip it in the bud um on the front side but of course people can change situations can change um and so yeah you do always need to have some kind of conflict resolution procedure and then in your bylaws will be specified how it is that you remove somebody do you need a unanimous minus one vote to do it or is it just a simple majority or two-thirds or whatever it is so i wonder if this is relevant to the question but i noticed that um you, the so the the u.s federation of worker co-ops has a jobs uh, a job section where co-ops are list what positions they have available mm-hmm. and that's part of the hiring process you would say you know um yeah 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 but you know, I think it was Gronky and I. We were looking at that. We we're kind of wondering, like, hmm. Well, I wonder, like, if any of these co-ops are like desperate to where they're just kind of like grabbing any business people relevant in that field. And what might that mean for maintaining like a cooperative mm-hmm. culture, um, rather than just like 
that you know that's pushing more away from capitalism and the oppression that allowed some people to want to escape and kind of like oh yeah putting them closer into that when the priority is like all the aggressive um accumulation that you're usually taught in traditional Catholics company. Wow. Yep. Yeah. No, it's uh it's it's definitely something that happens like in food co ops where you know they're trying to find somebody who has experience at being a general manager of a grocery store. It's a very small field of people who know how to do that well and apparently it, it is a real legit skill set um and so yeah a lot of food co-ops will end up hiring somebody just out of the grocery industry um it is an issue uh and sometimes yeah they bring you know non-cooperative values with them so that's one thing that we definitely need to do better whenever bringing somebody from some professional in from the non-co-op world make sure they get a good co-op education before they are given responsibilities um next question do you all know of any tech co-ops yes all right chris you <laughs> tech co-op agaric agaric yes agaric yeah. uh is a tech co-op and they do web developments uh mainly i think and um part of that i think they're I don't know if they're like officially supporting the community bridge um, that Mickey, one of their members, is doing. But I, man, I really like that big blue button instance uh, that mm -hmm. uh, the collective that Mickey's working with. And before it was just Mickey, I think like uh, two years ago, but now there's this core team. And hopefully they do formalize from being a worker collective to a worker co op. and. I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up being a hybrid co-op because, um, you know, Mickey's got experience in May 1st and it's a hybrid co-op. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's yeah. another one. May 1st. May 1st. Uh, May 1st. Um, Electric Embers is another uh, hosting cooperative. Um, let's see. There's Palante Tech. Uh, there's Co-Tech. There's the Boston Tech Collective. There's the San Francisco Tech Collective. Is Sass um, Press? Uh, sassafras tech, tech cooperative shout tech out collective, sassafras i saw them in the in the usfwc slack like i think mm -hmm. they're maybe they're among the first supporting the palestinians um mm, support nice the yeah um so i guess long story short there's a bunch of tech co-ops uh the tech field in general is is very i guess co-op friendly uh largely because you know, most of the equipment you need is just in people's heads, right? And and uh, often doesn't need a whole lot of huge startup budget to do something like web development or graphic design uh, or um, uh, designing point of sale systems, stuff like that. It's, uh, you know, software development is not, doesn't need a whole lot of, of upfront capital. So yes, there are lots of tech co-ops doing all kinds of things. I mentioned the Boston, the San Francisco tech collectives. They do more like, uh, you know, personal computer repair and sales and stuff like that. Um, you know, people doing web design, people doing, uh, creating, um, like I said, point of sale systems, stuff like that. So there's, um, and there's <laughs> of all people, you know, these folks, the tech industry would probably be the best at compiling the latest, biggest list of tech of, of their industry. <laughs> and I think they've seen a few. I think there's like that. I think platform cooperativism has like a list somewhere that's pretty big. Um, yes. And for so, Steve Ediger of Chai Commons uh, Co op in Chicago, I know that he's a big fan of um, Factic out of Argentina. That it's like a humongous mm. tech mm -hmm. co-op. Yep. I think it's like F A C T I C or something like that. I don't know. I, I, didn't, I haven't memorized. Um, yeah. I mean, in Isthmus, you mentioned Isthmus. You want to talk a tech company like uh, designing automation uh, robots and, and producing like automation technology. Like they're big time, high tech, high, high tech. Um, so any kind of tech and there's also i will mention this more again on the like the developer side of thing like software developer side of things uh, there is a guide called the freelancer's guide to starting a tech cooperative um or a tech freelancer's guide to starting a cooperative maybe that's it i'll put a link in the uh, description 
of this video um, to that document, um, co-written by Jim Johnson, one of our members, uh, and it's a it's a little bit on the older side. It's probably 15 years old or so, but it's uh, still a good guide um, to tech co-ops. So starting a forest cooperative, store it, a forest restoration cooperative. Um, so Jeremy, Jeremy Plant family here is uh, apparently working as a gardener. He's uh, are doing uh, forests, essentially maintaining forests in NYC, planting new forests, integrated land. Um, and they their work that they're now doing for the city is very hi hierarchical. It's nauseating, unproductive, and often unorganized. Recently, four of us have decided that we would like to work towards starting our own and the first ever New York-based urban forest restoration cooperative. Um, all the city... Uh, projects higher, that's H-I-E-R, higher, or H-I-R-E, higher, should be, uh, contractors to do much of the work. We essentially would like to be a cooperative contractor service providing quality work. Um, and their, their questions for doing this is, does anybody know of any cheap free resources to help us out in the beginning phase? Um, of doing this. Um, it's a very general question. And the very general answer for that is uh, ed.coop. I will say that's a one place I can recommend. Um, I helped uh, create that geo, helped design that um, website, along with the Association of Cooperative Educators. And it has a whole lot of, of resources on all different aspects of uh, co-ops. Um, there are a couple of their pages specifically for worker co-ops uh, and for co-op conversions, uh, pages for board members and, and, and other types of co-ops. So um, I would definitely say take a look at the ed.coop um, worker co-op page. And um, of course, subscribe to, you know, or uh, take a look at Geo regularly. Uh, you know, that's always good place to find resources. And also... I didn't leave a snarky comment for this guy yet, but I, I may do it. I would say, look in the sidebar of the Reddit cooperatives page on r slash cooperatives and uh, the moderators there. We have put together a, a very big list of um, cooperative resources and cooperative developers. And so clicking on any of those links definitely help out. Chris, any particular uh, educational resources that you like? No. Oh, um, just people, honestly. Um, especially those who've done, who've done the work. Um, I think there's even something to learn from the people who, um, who haven't done it cooperatively. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, you can certainly learn a lot about business stuff, right? Yeah, and what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> very important things to know what not to do. But yeah, I mean, this guy, he's very well set up. Uh, I said he worked as a worker owner in a landscaping co-op for three years. Um, and currently he's a sole proprietor regarding business. So um, yeah, I think this guy is, is well set up. I did point him to um, an interview that I did uh, a while back with Kim whose last name I won't try to pronounce, uh, from the Wisconsin, Wisconsin Natural History Cooperative. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, so I, I, I linked him to that. He said, you know, here's some people who did something similar. Um, and uh, yeah, best of luck to him. But... All right, well, that's all the questions that we have for today. And that's perfect because we're right at an hour. So... And hey, what are you going to do with the, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just going to say, I guess uh, we'll wrap up. Chris, do you have any closing thoughts or? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I would like to have like a soundbite of that part from Billy Madison. <laughs> I think that can be a compliment.